and say, welcome to Supporting Open Research Workflows. And I'm going to present Christopher Spaulding. He's from EBSCO, and he's the Product Manager for Research Output Workflow Solutions. Thanks, Kim. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, can you hear me, Kim? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so my name, as Kim said, is Christopher Spaulding. Um, uh, I'm a VP here at EBSCO and your uh, your humble host for our webinar today. Um, I'm not turning on my uh, uh, my video today because I'm I'm hanging out in my attic during our, our wonderful lockdown. Uh, so I just want to say we are extremely excited to be able to engage with uh, two academic researchers today uh, to better understand a, a few specific tools that they leverage in their day-to-day -day research. Uh, first, we'll, we'll hear from Mariana Rios, a researcher at the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University. Uh, Mariana will discuss Protocols.io, which, uh, which is an open access repository that supports the sharing and, and discovering and discussing of, of research um, protocols or, or methods. Protocols.io is, is truly integral to the reuse and reproducibility of research. Um, on, a, on a side note with Protocols.io, I've been uh, following a number of protocols during this time on Protocols.io that have to do with the coronavirus and COVID-19. And and seeing this research in, in real time has, has been truly uh, fascinating. Uh, our second presenter of the day will be, uh, will be Daniel Biting, who is Assistant Professor of Pathobiology uh, at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, Dan will discuss his use of, of the Code Ocean platform for both research and, and teaching. Uh, so CodeOcean is, is an online open access code execution platform that uh, that allows anyone to find, create, and share code and data. Uh, CodeOcean provides a, a complete working environment for a researcher who, who can collect data and, and work on their code, collaborate with others, uh, testing and running algorithms, doing analysis, et cetera, and then make it public for anyone to use, um, uh, to use, to embed, et cetera. Again, a, a, a focus on reuse and, and reproducibility uh, of research. So this, this past year, ESCO has, has chosen to engage with a number of companies uh, supporting the research workflow, um, uh, especially in areas of open research. We as a company see the value of, of supporting the research workflow from, from ideation through research to publication, uh, of course, with um, a focus also on discovery and delivery. And we also see the value of partnering with uh, and supporting innovative organizations uh, that are already experts within uh, research infrastructure. So by, by partnering with organizations like CodeOcean and, and Protocols.io, uh, EBSCO has been able to deliver to, to our core mission, which is to provide uh, information that is needed for research where and, and when it's needed. So to kick off the day, I'll hand off the presentation to uh, Mariana, and Mariana will hand it off then to, uh, to Daniel, and we'll finish up our conversation by me fielding uh, questions during our, our Q&A session at the end. Uh, so please feel free to post questions, as Kim noted, uh, during the presentation via the chat um, or, or Q&A um, block on the side. Um, I've also invited key people from both protocols.io and CodeOcean to join us to assist with questions if needed. Uh, so Pierre and Anita will be, uh, will be at the ready. So let me again thank you all for joining us, and Mariana, please uh, take it away. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, will you just confirm that you can hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, great. So my name is Mariana Rios. I am a PhD candidate at the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences in Stony Brook University. And for the past five years, I've been researching uh, a marine organism known as Atlanticitrium lamassinum, and it is a unicellular um, eukaryote. And this work has been funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation's Marine Microbiology Initiative, um, more specifically the Experimental Model System Strategy, in which actually more than 100 scientists spanning 41 research groups across the globe 
uh, collaborated on developing genetic tools for 39 diverse uh, unicellular marine eukaryotes known as protists. And so we were one of these uh, research groups who were interested in developing um, genetic tools specifically for orientocutrine lunacinum. And a critical component that facilitated this collaboration was protocols.io, um, in which a protist specific group um, was generated to uh, have these protocols be shared, um, be commented. And so this is a screenshot of um, this protist group on protocols.io. You can see there's over 200 members, over 200 um, published protocols, and so this excludes protocols that are currently being um, developed. And these protocols tend to be ones that have worked and also ones that have not worked, and really um, supports discovering um, strategies that are currently being used um, that may not be working or how to optimize um, strategies to actually produce um, these tools that, that we are focused on developing. Um, and so what this collaboration culminated in was the publication of a recent Nature Methods paper titled Genetic Tool Development in Marine Protus Emerging Model Organisms for Experimental Cell Biology. And I've included here the, um, the author list and the associated institutions to really capture the, the extent of this collaborative effort. And, um, and I've also included here a table um, directly coming out of the publication that includes, so I'll have it here, um, my organism of interest and the conditions that we developed for uh, possible transformation. Um, and as well on the right side column, the link to uh, the protocol. And so here is a screenshot of what the protocol actually looks like. And, um, some of my favorite features of protocols.io is that even though uh, the protocol will be published, so a DOI link um, will be created and can be cited, for instance, in, in publications, um, there is an ability to update these protocols, and I've actually updated this one several times, um, and that can be either through creating a new version or fork to um, create a new protocol. Um, and then other components that I really appreciate about protocols.io are the possibility of linking. Um, so, for instance, I've linked here uh, plasmid maps to um, this protocol, so plasmid that I've used, as well as the resource at which these, protocol, these um, plasmids can be purchased. And, um, and lastly, a feature that I really appreciate is the possibility of commenting. Um, so I've received several comments on this protocol from uh, scientists across the world that are interested in actually um, adapting this protocol to a related organism um, of Orantichytrium and being able to support their efforts through um, just this protocol being in existence and, um, and established. So, yep, that is all. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions about how protocols.io um, can be used in open um, research systems. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we will take the um, uh, questions at the, the very end. And now let's pass this on to, uh, to Dan. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Hopefully, you can see my screen now. We can see and hear you. Thanks. Great, great. So um, hi, everyone, and thank you all for joining. It's great to see. Uh, such a large number of people attending, so it's very exciting. Um, it's a topic that I think is very important um, in, 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 for the science community as a whole. It's certainly important for my lab, and I'll touch on that in this, in this talk. Um, so my name is Dan Biting, and I'm an assistant professor of pathobiology at the veterinary school at the University of Pennsylvania. If you're interested in the kind of work we do, you can check out our website, um, because in addition to having a research lab, I have a, I, I help direct a center for host microbial interactions. And so broadly speaking, my research, which I really won't get into the details of my research in, in, in today, but my, my research deals with infectious diseases and how we can use, uh, you know, cutting edge genetic and genomic tools 
to understand how pathogens interact with their host. And so what one consequence of the kind of research we do is that we, we generate a lot of data and, and we use a lot of software. And so we often find ourselves uh, you know, feeling, feeling a, a bit uh, like this or in this position where we, um, we're sort of surrounded by our data outputs, right? So we, we have code uh, that we write or that we reuse from other people uh, to help us analyze large amounts of data. And these large amounts of data are coming off routinely now coming out of, of the kinds of experiments that we and many other labs are doing. Uh, this is a major research product that, that um, is ubiquitous across biomedical research, large data generation. And then, uh, you know, by combining our code with our data, we generate various visualizations of our data and we kind of iterate through this, looking at our data in different ways, slicing our data in different ways. Um, and so this really poses a real challenge, not just to, to myself as a, as a lab head, but to anyone in biomedical research, right? Because at some point, we have to kind of take this confusing world that we, we sit in and we have to communicate it in a clear and concise way to our supervisor and we have to communicate it in a clear and concise way to our team. And I'm using that term very generally uh, because that team sometimes might be your lab mates. Sometimes it might be, uh, you know, an audience at a scientific conference. And other times, as we're seeing now with, with the COVID-19 outbreak, it may be the public, right? Um, and, and I will say there's another important person in this team, and it's yourself, right? So we, the other thing we really struggle with in science is knowing exactly what we did six months ago and how to do it again in a way that's efficient and, and accurate and how we can sort of pass off the research we're doing to a new researcher that might be coming into the lab in a way that they can pick up and, and start doing that work just as efficiently as you were doing it uh, when, when you sort of pass the baton to them. So that's really the challenge. And I think uh, whether you're talking about protocols.io or CodeOcean or other tools, we're looking for solutions that help us in this in this space because communicating the the results of our research products is really challenging to do. Uh, so I think you know ideally we'd like to be moving toward the right hand side of this reproducibility spectrum, and this is quite old now. It was published by Roger Peng uh, almost ten years ago, but I think it's very relevant and topical today. Um, and I, unfortunately, I think most laboratories, most researchers still sit on this um, far left end of not being very reproducible. Journals have tried to help with that in implementing uh, strict guidelines for how we make our data available and how we make our code available. But, but by and large, we focus still on publication, right? Um, so I, my, my sort of feeling, and, and, and I think, you know, one of the the big challenges for biomedical researchers now is getting folks on board with this. But my feeling is that if you start in a research project, uh, actually with the intention to, to operate on this end of the spectrum, then you strive for the highest quality of work. So if your goal at the outset of a project is to be able to produce a research product that is reproducible, that's shareable, that's findable, um, and that can can sort of lend itself to full replication, then by, by its very nature, then you're trying to make a project that's, um, that's as high quality as possible. Because people are going to be able to look at that project in great detail and reproduce it. Um, so I'll show you an example of how we've tried to move from the left to the right in this reproducibility spectrum, starting with this idea of jumping from publication only to putting together publication and code. And I'll give you examples along the way of, of what we're doing. And, and by no means are we experts in this, but I think we're getting better. Um, and, and it takes practice, actually, uh, and, uh, to, to, to get really good at this sort of thing. Uh, so publication in code. Well, what, one way we've tried to do that is we always include a supplementary file in our papers. And this is an example of a science translational medicine paper that I'll, I'll bring up again in just a moment. Um, but, you know, attached to that paper is a PDF file. And that PDF file, and the details of this aren't so important, but that PDF file, when you open it and view it, has a very organized table of contents that walks you through our research logic, basically. How did we, how did we tackle this problem? 
and what's the code that we used? Um, and how did that code link to the actual graph or plot that we produced? So I've highlighted in red text here, um, they can simply click on this table of contents and they'll be taken to an explanation of that figure, the code that was used to generate it and the figure itself. And we've done that um, in other cases as well, even when we're not the ones leading the work. So you know, here's an example of a, a lab also at the veterinary school that I work closely with. Um, and this was not our work, this was their work, but we helped them analyze the data and we encouraged them to produce uh, the same sort of output, right? So a supplementary code file that's organized and easily accessible and, and transparent. So this really helps us with transparency in our research by bundling together um, our, our publication with our code. We've now you know, moved towards putting together not just the paper, but the code and the data, right? So that PDF, when people open it, there's no data there. They, they, they have the code, they have the output, but they don't have the input. So how do we give them the input? Well, here's an example of a paper we published last year uh, where that paper is linked to a GitHub site. And if you're not familiar with GitHub, it's not a big deal. It's, it's a collaborative software development platform. It's free, um, but uh, many people use it just to house their scripts and data and link it to a paper, okay? And so here's the, these are called repos or repositories. Here's the GitHub repo for this, this study published in, in Microbiome. And it has a detailed explanation of what you can find there and how to take full advantage of it. But having this GitHub repo in no way sort of, uh, you, you know, provides an immutable uh, connection between the paper and the code and the data. And so we take this a step further and we use something called Zenodo that lets us put together our GitHub repo with data and to tie that to our paper and give both our paper, of course, the publisher does, does this on the paper side, but on the data and code side, we get a DOI for that Zenodo um, uh, implementation as well. All right, so now this is immutably linked to the paper. If we go in and change the GitHub repository, it does not change this Zenodo. This is sort of time stamped and locked down. And now this is, I think, a better uh, approach to gather all these components together. But it's not, it's not the final sort of, um, you know, a step in that reproducibility spectrum because it still has problems. And those problems are that there's really, right, the obvious one, right, there's no computer here. So anyone who were to access this paper, the GitHub repo, or the Zenodo um, resource would not have a computer to run that code and produce that research output again. Um, but I mean, maybe more relevant is that they don't have the software. I just told you in the beginning that we use a lot of bioinformatics code, but also a lot of software written by other people to do our analysis. And none of that software is included in any three of these, uh, these, these um, pieces that we've put together here. And that's actually a real challenge because installing bioinformatics software requires that you work in the command line, sort of this you know, uh, working under the hood in your computer. Um, and, and a lot of times getting the software installed is really challenging because the software that we used changes by the time you uh, go and try to install it six months or a year from now. So that really raises questions about, is this really reproducible? If the individuals who look at these three components here can't actually redo the analysis, then it, it's, it's clearly lacking something. So the nice thing is we're in a, a, a time when there are solutions to all of these problems, um, but never, at least not until we sort of came across Code Ocean, never really in one place. So the solution for not having hardware is that you use a cloud computer, right? You use a computer that's been set up by Amazon or Google Cloud, and you access that computer through a web browser. The problem of not having software, also an easy fix. There are solutions that bundle together many different pieces of software, programs, et cetera, um, into uh, units that make it easy to install them. And these are things like Docker and, and other resources that, that let you easily bundle up software. 
And then if you have a cloud computer and you have uh, an easy way to get software onto that cloud computer, then you're in a position to run a full analysis on the cloud. If you can connect that cloud computer with these uh, research components. Um, so that then brings us to this idea of what's really needed for full replication. How do we link our code, our data, and our publication in a way that anyone, regardless of their bioinformatics expertise or their skill level or knowledge, could uh, rep reproduce uh, the data, the results you got in that paper? And so that's where um, my group uh, really started um, becoming very interested in Code Ocean and worked closely with uh, the, the great team at Code Ocean to help get us started and, and get off the ground. And Code Ocean is, is really that solution that I, I mentioned that kind of brings together this idea of cloud computing, um, uh, easy installation of software, uh, and, and the ability to then take this cloud instance and anyone can reuse it, uh, copy it, and then modify it. And so I thought I'd give you an example of that going to go over to my web browser here. So if you click on the link in the bottom of that slide, it takes us over here to Code Ocean. Um, and you're, what you're looking at here is uh, one of these code capsules that Code Ocean produces that bundles everything together. And so on the left hand side are all these components, these inputs, data, code. And, uh, and if I click on my environment button, I can see that here I have all my software. So I have my data, I have my code, I have my software, and I have an operating system. I have a computer, all in the cloud, all accessible through a web browser. Now I don't need to worry about installing software. It's already embedded in this code capsule. And anyone who publicly, and this is a publicly available code capsule, anybody who discovers this capsule or who uh, gets here by, by by um, following the link in the manuscript, for example, they find themselves in this exact same environment. This is the public facing version, it's published, see? So they have everything at their disposal. And if they choose to, and this does in the way here, they can rerun the entire analysis of the paper. And what you can see is the output that they get is every figure from the paper. So as an example, clicking on any of these will open those figures. So here is one of the sort of a complex graph that we produced for the paper, easily reproduced here, no guesswork involved. Other simpler graphs, also easy to produce, and on and on, even tables of data, which is shown up here. So the full manuscript is completely um, reproducible. Okay, so um, where does that leave us? Well, we, we were able to take this with, with Code Ocean's help a step further by actually embedding that code capsule into the manuscript, into the publisher's manuscript web page, so that folks who are reading this paper don't need to go directly to Code Ocean. They can see that that reproducibility is actually embedded directly within, um, within the journal page. And so we'll head back to the browser here and I'll just show you, here's the journal page. If we just scroll down and we click on supplementary materials, um, we go all the way down to the bottom, here is the Code Ocean capsule for this science translational medicine paper embedded right in the journal page. So they could actually run it from here and reproduce uh, what we've done in the paper. All right, so. So I thought I'd just close by some of the other ways we're thinking of using this kind of platform. And that is to, to promote reproducibility in the classroom. So we talk a lot about uh, you know, the idea of reproducibility. And usually when we're, we're, we're talking about reproducibility, we, we really mean with respect to data and analysis and the scientific method. But I feel there's another need for reproducibility, which is in teaching. And if that's ever been, if, that, if, that, if that's never been more clear than now, where we have this massive need for online, for students, uh, graduate students, undergraduates, to tap into uh, you know, online learning materials that are delivered in a consistent and clear way. And so we have a course we've been running for about five or six years on analysis of uh, gene expression data. So again, it has a biomedical slant to it, of course, because that's our lab's interest. 
but it deals with a lot of the same issues many people do in, in teaching graduate students in biomedical sciences, which is how to analyze data, how to think about it, and how to work with large data sets. And so, in really what we want then is this idea of fair, our, the, 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 the idea we usually apply to our data, making it findable, making it accessible, interoperable, and reusable, we'd like those FAIR principles to be applied to our teaching as well. And so one of, what we've done now is we've connected our classroom to make it completely reproducible, the actual class itself. And the way we do that is our entire course, first of all, is hosted on GitHub. Even the course web page is served by GitHub. So it can be copied in its entirety all the content of the course, the syllabus, the data, the scripts, even the links to our videos on Vimeo are all easily copied. All someone has to do is just copy our, our um, GitHub repository for the course. In addition, through CodeOcean's help, we were able to set up a course capsule. And so this capsule now, instead of embedding all the data and all the code uh, for uh, reproducing an analysis in a paper, it bundles all the code and all the data, all the homework for a course. And so um, I'll just head over again to the browser, and this is uh, sort of the end of, of what I have to, to show you, but um, here is that course capsule. Now we don't have to spend time up front having students install software, it's already installed. Their computer is already set up. Uh, and we have all of the steps of the course broken down here for the code. We have, we call these hack dashes. This is homework in class um, uh, working projects. We have those all here. We have data and CodeOcean, because of the way they work, they're able to load publicly available data sets so, they're ex so that they're accessible to anyone who copies the capsule. So we have data, not actually part of the capsule per se, it's being pulled from a public data repository that CodeOcean has set up. So the students have a lot of data sets to work with in the course. Um, they have data sets I've provided as well. And then they have all the code, all the software, and the computer. So when uh, teachers are looking for materials they want to use to deliver as online curriculum, they could simply copy this course capsule, and um, they could have everything they need. They could also copy the website through GitHub. Okay. So that's really it. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have, but that's um, really how my group's uh, working on improving our transparency and reproducibility, both in our research work and in our teaching work. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing now and turn it back over to the hosts. Thank you. Thank you both. That, uh, very informative. That was fantastic. Um, uh, we do have a couple of questions, but if there are more questions coming from uh, um, the attendees today, please feel free to drop them into the chat or Q&A um, windows. So we have, um, let's start out with, there's a question here coming in uh, via the Q&A um, for Mariana, uh, and uh, Anita may need to, uh, to help with this as well. But what is the unique power of protocols.io? Uh, relative to something like GitHub. Uh, looks like there is a specific item type for protocols, though. Is the ability to create the structured, shareable, versionable items the uh, most useful feature? I can take this one, maybe. Unless, Mariana, is it okay? That would be great, Anita. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hello everybody. Um, my name is Anita Prolox and I'm the head of outreach here at um, protocols.io. Um, and that's actually a very great question. And it's very true that protocols.io has a lot of similar functionality to GitHub in terms of versioning and the forking functionality. But um, it is a little bit different because we specifically specialize for the scientific community. And I would say that usually if, if people in the lab are not necessarily the computational people. They don't hang out around GitHub too much. And protocols.io has a lot of functionality that is specialized for like wet lab protocols. So we have like all these components that you can use for like amounts and like timers you can set and all that kind of uh, thing. So, but it does have like the forking and the versioning is very similar to GitHub, that's correct. 
I hope that Thank answers you. the question. Thank you, uh, Anita. Uh, Mariana, there, there's another question for you. Um, I noticed that protocols has a metrics tab. What metrics are available from protocols.io and have you used any of these metrics um, within your research? Hi, so again, um, I think Anita may be um, able to share. I have not actually used any of these metrics. Sure. I can help with that one again. Um, so the metrics we do capture on the protocols are one, um, of course, like the views over time. So you can see how many people are viewing the protocol. And then you can also track how many people are exporting like the a PDF version of your protocol. And we also have a, a run functionality where people when they're in the lab and they're ready to do an experiment, they can click run and that gives them a checklist like functionality where they check off every single step as they complete it. And then you have like a, a protocol record of that specific experiment. So you can see how many people are running your protocol. And then also think like how many people are bookmarking and commenting on your protocol or how many people are creating forks. So like how many people are modifying your protocol to their own needs. So those are the things we capture. And then also it has like an alt metric, um, an alt metric feature. So you can see how many people are sharing your protocol on Twitter, for example, and discussing it um, publicly. Those are some of the metrics that we do capture on every protocol. And uh, Anita, one more for you. Um, has there been any discussion about conjoining uh, the protocols with a video of the lab work being done? Yeah, that's another very great question. And we do love video protocols and we do support um, videos so you can include videos to either like an abstract part of your protocol or also we do see a lot of people including very short video clips for every step so because the protocols are en entered in like an easy to follow step by step description so you can insert, insert shorter video clips for every single step um, so you can do that so video protocols are great yeah thank you uh, a question for Dan um, regarding Code Ocean. Can the code be edited by those who uh, read a published journal paper that contains a code capsule? Uh, yeah, so the answer is yes and no. <laughs> the, uh, the, the code that is actually associated with the manuscript itself can't be changed because we want that to be immutable so that you can always see exactly um, how we did the analysis that we report in the paper. But when you click on that code capsule, you can copy it. And, and in fact, if you choose to, to rerun the analysis, that's what's happening. It's making a copy of that capsule and it's putting that copy somewhere else uh, for you. And yes, that copy is yours to change and, and develop upon or modify. And so that's really important because it means you can, uh, instead of starting from scratch with an analysis, if you, um, if you see you know, a workflow, for example, um, or an approach that's valuable for your own work, and that is reported in a code capsule, then you could go just copy that code capsule and start from there instead of starting from scratch. That's great. Uh, this is an interesting one. Um, does your institution use proprietary course learning management software? If so, have you received any backlash from making your course entirely open off another platform? That's a great question. Um, so the University of Pennsylvania used to use Blackboard. Now it uses Canvas. Um, you know, I, I'm not a fan of either. Um, so so we have a we have an office of well online learning initiative and Center for Teaching and Learning. Both are great. And OLI, the the online learning initiative, has been really interested in in helping us make the course as available as we as we can. Um, and, and so far, we haven't run into any conflicts. I think the issue, um, there may be issues that arise when and if we decide to make the course an online course, right, through edX or Coursera or something like that, then, um, then I, I, I think there's a number of options. Um, and, and, and so they've, so far, they, there hasn't been a conflict, really. They've been interested in helping us make the course materials accessible. Interesting. Uh, another question for you is, uh, how are data and code licensed in CodeOcean? 
That's a great question as well. And I am not a licensing person, um, but you can choose the kind of license you want to associate with your code and your data. Um, I think folks from Code Ocean are on, and I can let them speak to the licensing issue in more detail. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. This is Pierre Montagano. I'm actually the director of business development for Code Ocean, but I, I wear a lot of different hats. We're kind of a, a small team. Um, so, the, in terms of one thing, Code Ocean is a, a completely open uh, and uh, so open access platform. So, code and data. When you when you deposit code and data in Code Ocean, it becomes available for everyone to 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 look at. That said, um, um, you, you, uh, the code is owned by the researchers. Code Ocean is not interested in, 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 own, in copywriting the code, and anyone can download the code outside of uh, Code Ocean, right? So we're, we're not creating a walled garden. Anyone that finds a, a, a code capsule in Code Ocean has the ability to download everything right out of Code Ocean. And researchers select their, their, the, 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 um, the license that they want to associate to their code. And uh, so if they want to, we encourage everyone, our default for code is MIT and for um, data CC0. So we, we're hoping people are permissive in the code that they, the, uh, the licensing that they select. But you can select any license you want. Uh, but just know, and it can be a very restrictive license, but, but know that anyone could download it. And, and, um, and, and, and one of the, the key you know, use cases of Code Ocean, as Dan was talking about, was was reusing the code, you know, finding something that's that's pertinent to you, and then and then and then you know making a, a copy of it and making a derivative work. I hope that, that answers the question. Thanks, Peter. That's that's uh, that's great. actually uh, um, a, a, another question for Code Ocean. Um, uh, where does Code Ocean uh, store its data? These data sets uh, is it cloud-based, local, both? So it's all in the cloud, right? And 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 uh, there are uh, uh, there is a place in Code Ocean. It's a, called the Manage Data Sets tab. So anyone can upload their 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 data into Code Ocean. Um, but we actually have a, a a special place called the Manage Data Sets tab where we actually upload uh, data and keep it really close to the computing environment, AWS. And so if there is a common data set that a community uses, sometimes they'll ask us to preload that particular data set. And, and some of them are already in Amazon, like a lot of atmospheric data is already being deposited in Amazon. Uh, but yes, it's all cloud-based. Uh, another one, are you using a personal account um, for Code Ocean or is it an institutional account? That would be to... Uh, to yeah. I can answer that. It's, it's, a, it's a personal account, um, not, not an institutional one. Uh, another one coming in. Does Code Ocean assign identifiers, permanent identifiers, DOIs to the code capsule? Thanks. Absolutely, yes. And and um, on one of the slides, uh, I had indicated the DOI for that capsule. So yes, once you publish a code capsule, right? So the process of setting up a code capsule is you set up an account on Code Ocean, uh, you build your capsule, and and I can tell you the Code Ocean staff were really um, uh, extremely helpful when we would would start that process of building a capsule, figuring out what software we want on it, getting our code and data into the right folders. But once it looks good and and it's it's um, ready um, to to publish, there is a an option there to to publish that Code Ocean capsule. And when you do that, it, it's assigned a, a DOI. It's actually reviewed first by the Code Ocean staff, so there's an additional level of scrutiny or or quality control, really, to make sure the capsule works, <laughs> that it functions properly, that there's no unnecessary code or data present in the capsule. So once it clears that quality control step, it's officially published and assigned a DOI. And Pierre may have additional comments to add, but that's been my experience. Right. No, th thanks, Dan. Um, the only thing I would just point out is it's not a peer review. It's it's really what we call it a verification. So the team here at Code Ocean are really dedicated, but they're not subject area experts. They are, a lot of them. The verifiers are researchers, um, but uh, but they're they're not subject area experts. So they're just doing a verification that the code is self. It's all self contained. It runs. Uh, it delivers results. Um, a lot of times they'll give you hints, like if you if there's a file that keeps getting called up, they'll they'll ask you to cache it to to improve the runtime of the code. But but they're not peer reviewers. 
Right. So, so as an example, they're never going to look at your script and say, hey, that's, that's weird. You did a student's t-test there. Uh, it doesn't look like your data is normally distributed. Should you be doing maybe something like a Man Whitney test, right? That's, that's, never, that's, that's not part of the review process. Um, so, so that's an important distinction. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I'd like to, I'd like to point out uh, protocols.io also will mint uh, DOIs. And in, in both cases, I believe there and Anita, um, these are versioned as well. So um, if you uh, extend or fork, uh, you will get a new uh, DOI. That, that, that's right on, on the Code Ocean side. So we have a version one of our course capsule, but we're getting ready to release version two. And we're doing that ahead of a, a, a manuscript to describe this idea of a a course and a capsule and, and these resources we're building for the community. That's great. Uh, Sorry for protocols too. Thank you, Anita. Yeah. Uh, there is a question here all as well um, on, uh, do you have a plan to create a public repository of protocols and code capsules? I believe that's actually for, for EBSCO because uh, presently there are public repositories for both protocols.io and uh, Code Ocean. These are these are you know, open access. Once you once you publish, um, uh, we uh, EBSCO we are looking to more closely integrate uh, with these organizations. We see what they're doing as innovative and extremely useful for uh, the research process, and we're looking at ways to be able to more closely integrate um, uh, this with our current uh, uh, content. Um, let's see, this is great, the amount of uh, information coming in. Um, we're coming to the end of uh, the 45 minutes, so I'll just hit on a couple other things. Um, is detailed documentation for both products on the web? Um, I, I, I believe so. I, both um, uh, Anita and uh, Pierre, you can comment to that? Yes, correct. Yes, also correct for protocols. For code, is there a standard metadata schema for code capsules? Uh, there, there is, and if you go to the metadata tab in any compute capsule, to, it's, it's an open platform. Anyone can go. You'll, you'll see that uh, that uh, the, the metadata that we we ask for, and it, we we mint our DOIs through data sites, so we follow that that protocol. And uh, Anita, uh, protocols.io mints their DOI, DOIs through. What service? Um, that's a good question, and I should know this, and I usually know it. Um, Crossref. Yeah, Crossref. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Sorry you. about that. I almost like <laughs> uh, And then finally, would, would, um, Chris, would you like to see the metadata capture quickly? Is that useful or no? Uh, yeah, no, that would be great. Here, I, I've got it up on the screen here. So this is the um, uh, metadata for the course capsule. I'll actually toggle over to one of the other capsules here. Um, so uh, what you can see here is the sort of metadata capture that, that um, was just referenced. We have, uh, you know, the exact abstract and, and author list from the publication. You can tag uh, this capsule with, with the same sort of keywords you might use in a paper. The DOI, um, so this was the v version one that was uh, published along with the paper, citation, license, authors, corresponding author, um, and, and additional information, including you know grants that you may want to cite and, and and that sort of thing. So it's all all there, very easy to fill in. That's great. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple more questions. Um, we'll compile all of these and. Uh, when we send out the, uh, the recording from, uh, from the, today's webinar. Uh, again, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today, and I would be, I'd very much like to thank uh, our presenters for sharing their experiences and for taking the time uh, to talk to us all. So feel free to reach out with uh, further questions regarding these solutions, and um, thank you all. Stay safe and, and healthy during these times. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.